Good morning. It's Thursday, December 11th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 104. Well, anything after 100 just sounds like a whole lot of shows. My name is Chris, and today I'm joined by our excellent Mumble team. It's, it's actually like a light holiday crew. Time-appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hello, everybody. Hi there. So, uh, all right, guys, we have a lot to get into. One of the stories that we let breathe for a little bit over the last couple of days is the Sony hack story, because it just seemed like we were talking about it a lot. And I thought, okay, we'll put it on the shelf, we'll put a pin in it, as they say, and we'll wait and see if anything interesting develops. This story, there was, okay, i, I got to back up a little more. See, during all of the Sony stuff, after the hack was out, there was a sub-story that wasn't getting a lot of attention, and that was a lot of the big seeds of the pirated Sony content were being DDoSed by somebody. And I kept trying to figure out, who's doing the DDoSing? Who's doing that? Well, now it looks like it's Sony that's been doing the DDoSing. Sony is going after the very groups that are sharing their files. Uh, the company is using hundreds of computers in Asia to execute what's known as a denial of service attack on sites where its pilfered data is, be is made available. This is according to two people with direct knowledge of the source. That's how Recode likes to roll. Sony is using Amazon Web Services, the Internet Retailer's cloud computing unit, which operates data centers in Tokyo and Singapore to carry out the counterattack. One of the sources said, this is again, someone familiar with the matter. The tactic was once commonly employed by media companies to combat the movie and pri pirate industry, piracy industry back in the day. They would use, uh, for example, Sony's previous tactics were to, to put bogus large files on file sharing networks to get people to download that and waste their time doing that. So the person familiar with the sources, this is kind of just in line with how we used to do things in the new era. Launching a DDoS attack against people sharing stolen files. Has Sony become the hacker? What do you think, Lionhead? I, I don't really know. It seems a little bacony, but I guess it could be a way to try to uh, attack them. Well, now, uh, somebody, somebody has been doing DDoS attacks since these files have been going online. And it would make sense that, that somebody would be Sony... But uh, it's got to be against the terms of service for Amazon Web Services to use it like this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, Sony also has the infrastructure and, I guess, the data to do this kind of attack on a larger scale. Hmm. I think it's kind of interesting. Anybody else in the mumble room have any thoughts on this? I think it's wasted effort because <laughs> they, should, they should be worrying about like the documents that got leaked and their clients and the movie stars they employ rather than the movie files. I understand it's a content loss and um, they're going to lose revenue, but it seems like they're they're not focused in the right direction. And it yeah. is just blatant abuse of whatever they're doing. I'm on board with, uh, like, I'm a con. It's like it, it, any kind of DDoS seems like it would be illegal. And there's going to be other people that have their service affected that are maybe on the same network as the as the target. I mean, it's it's not a, not a clean operation. It's kind of a... If this is true, I would love to see some investigation into this. So it's a story... I, Recode is citing two familiar sources. Now... You know, I that you that's it's it's dawn over re, at Recode. You can you take it or leave it, but uh, I have a feeling that if they got double sources for it, it's probably there's a good chance it's accurate. And w w who says they can't do it? I mean, it doesn't seem like anybody's going to stop them. They're too busy making it about uh, North Korea. Anyways, the uh, Sony well, hack story continues to be interesting. Yeah, last thought. Yeah, it's actually, I wonder the legality of this. Apparently, the states have considered many times that hacktivism through DDoS is illegal and actually made arrests over it. So, wouldn't this principle be applicable to Sony as a corporation as well? And what will be the implications if we can prove it's them? Like, I would think so. I would think, and I would think that if it's using AWS, there's got to be a way to track that back to Sony. Somebody's paying for exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, yeah, I I'd actually, I, I'm actually going to try and investigate this and report to authorities, see what they do. Yeah, I'd be curious to know what you find out. Uh, all right, so let's talk about a peer-to-peer -peer browser. Uh, it's not using WebRTC, which is what I thought might happen one day, but it's uh, coming from the folks over at BitTorrent. So you can probably guess it's using the Torrent protocol. BitTorrent Inc., the company behind things like BitTorrent Sync, and now obviously the owners of uTorrent and, you know, BitTorrent the uh, mainline client, 
They call the project Maelstrom, the browser, will be able to keep the internet open, they say, by serving websites from other users. Project Maelstrom, as it's called, is at the very early stages of development, but BitTorrent is gearing up to send out invites for a closed alpha test soon. It works on top of the BitTorrent protocol. Websites are published as torrents, and then Maelstrom treats them as first-class citizens instead of just downloadable content, whatever that means. So, if a website is contained within a torrent, we treat it just like a normal web page coming over HTTP, they say. Okay. I don't know exactly how that would work. This is, I mean, you got to figure, great for static content. I don't know exactly how that's going to work for dynamic content. More details are expected to follow in the months to come, though. Uh, those interested in Project Maelstrom can sign up, and we have a link in the uh, show notes for the alpha invite. Um, you know, I, I know there's a standard response to this stuff in the Jupiter Broadcasting audience. Uh, doesn't matter. Not open source. Uh, it would be better if it was open source. That seems to be the mantra for anything coming out of the BitTorrent community. So taking that aside, I do love the idea of a peer-to-peer -peer browser. I don't know if I love the idea of building over BitTorrent, though. I, I don't know. I just don't... I mean, I'll wait for the details. I don't know how the dynamic content's going to work. But uh, Rotten Corpse, have you seen this? Any thoughts on it? Uh, I haven't I haven't put any play with it, but I've seen the uh, stories about it, and it, it looks interesting. But as far as dynamic content, like you were saying, um, it's a massive failure. Yeah, I would think so, right? <laughs> how could it? How could a server push unless the server somehow dynamically created torrents? And then that would be really odd. Yeah, and I also agree with Imacon. I think it does matter. I think bit. I, I think for people in our audience, it does matter. But I think there's a majority of people on the internet where it doesn't matter as long as it's, if it's something they can trust somehow. However, they arrive to that trust is on their own. For a lot in our community, it's if it's if you can see the code. But for them, it's another mechanism. So uh, the idea would be, you know, this could avoid shutdowns, government censorships. I mean, it could be a powerful idea if it all works out. So I look forward to keep an eye on it, see what happens. Hey, let's just, uh, I'll be honest, uh, I'm just covering this story because this involves lasers. And I, I don't know, maybe in the catalog of Tech Talk today, when we go down the, when aliens come hundreds of years from now and they arrive at Earth and they go to archive.org and they find old episodes of Tech Talk today from the early 2000s, they'll look at this story and be like, ah, oh, that's when those quaint humans developed laser technology. Uh, now, obviously, we've had lasers for a while, but now we can actually shoot things and they're going to be mounted on boats. The U.S. Navy has approved the first laser weapon for operation aboard a Persian Gulf ship. Now, uh, it's mostly audio, but I want to play a little bit. Of, you know me. I love playing the videos. And they do shoot some stuff. And what's crazy is it's not as powerful as some of their other guns. Uh, and they even say that. That's not really the point. What's great about it is, first of all, you don't have to reload. So as long as you have steady power, it can keep shooting. It has extreme precision, and it also chemically alters whatever it hits, which can also have some tactical advantages to it. Uh, so it's part of a $40 million research program to uh, test out uh, energy-directed weapons. And it's, a first, it's, a, it's the first to officially be deployed on an operational vessel at the sea. Now here you're watching it remotely shoot these targets. Watch this. Watch this precision. It blows just the things right off the edge of that table from the boat. Not the whole table, just the thing on top of the table. They can get so accurate. So look, now they're going to show you. Here's a guy. He's using an Xbox controller to target the damn thing. And now watch. They'll zoom in. They, they target just the uh, package on the top of the boat there. The boat still remains. Watch those. Watch those. Boom. And just those pipes are gone. The uh, mannequin still remains standing. So, and then watch, now they'll shoot a drone down. So this is great if, like, there was a drone swarm coming at it because you don't have the reload time. It can just keep going pop, pop, pop. Of course, you get that Xbox controller interface. Uh, wow. So the invisible energy beam right now costs uh, 59 cents per shot, which has got to be way cheaper than, like, just about any other weapon on that boat. So there you go. Frickin' lasers are now a thing on boats. And uh, it, I don't, I mean, uh, it's kind of neat, to be honest. It's, it's The video's pretty good. Uh, the laser shot, unfortunately, I know how, I know what you were worried. Or I know what you were ho hoping for like I was. Uh, it doesn't look like phaser shots or something from Star Trek. In fact, you can't even see it at all. The energy beam is totally invisible. So yeah, I, was, I was also hoping for sound effects like... <laughs> 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 I love that you had that on the ready. That's, that's great. And telling also. Yeah. So uh, there you go. Crazy times ahead. Can't wait till I have the uh, home version mounted on drones. Oh, wait. Yes, I can. 
public service announcement before we go on. Uh, there is a lot of activity in this in the password management space these days, and LastPass is rolling out an auto password change feature. Now, come on, admit it. As skeptical as you are, you've wanted this. Come on, you've wanted a lot. This is so cool. So now when you use the password manager in the GUI, below the password, there'll be a box to change your password automatically for you. Currently, LastPass supports 75 different account providers, including Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Dropbox. Uh, rather than going through a cloud network, LastPass says the changes happen locally on your device, so the company never has access to your actual password. Um, and... Uh, of course, when you click that change password button, LastPass automatically generates the password and automatically stores the password and updates the entry for you. So it's a pretty slick system. Why am I mentioning this? Because I think you should go use LastPass or some sort of password manager. <laughs> and LastPass seems like a good one. And there is another uh, there's another alternative out there right now called uh, Dashlane. I believe it's called Dashlane. Uh, and it is sort of offering the same feature where it'll manage your passwords and change them for you, but I, th I think it does it server-side. So this LastPass is doing it client-side. Uh, all right, last story before we run today. Just to, another story to note in, uh, in history. You can now fund your Microsoft wallet with your freaking Bitcoin. Yep, I got a link in the show notes on how to do it. You can now use Bitcoin to add money to your Microsoft account. I, I'm just going to say it again. You can now fund your Microsoft account to buy things like Xbox games, Xbox music, crap from the Windows Phone store. You can buy all that junk now using your fake internet money. How cool is that? Like, that's a big deal, right? Like, I don't see a lot of people talking about that, but it seems like a big deal to me. No, nobody thinks so. I think it validates uh, the coin and the currency. Uh, at least if this is actually being done by Microsoft, then it validates the currency. Yeah, it's it is. Like once yeah. big business feel that this is a way of getting money, it will mean getting money. And it will mean that it has value. So that's pretty much how it starts out. So right now, as we record, uh, the average, I, I go to BitcoinAverage.com, and this averages the price out across multiple exchanges. Right now, average Bitcoin price, $355. It's up 1.13% uh, today, or I guess over the last 24 hours. So it seems like it hasn't really, the news hasn't really affected the price of Bitcoin much, but... I think what is going to happen now, maybe, maybe in 2015, I mean, this would be crazy, but wouldn't it be nuts now if Valve starts accepting Bitcoin to fund your Valve account? There for the Steam store? I would lose all my Bitcoins instantly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if Microsoft starts having people buy Xbox games with Bitcoin... I don't think that'd be too much of a jump. Steam, because you have to remember, Steam, they don't have to assume any of the risk of Bitcoin. They can partner with BitPay or Coinbase or other ones, and they can actually transact. When that transaction occurs, when that when you pay with Bitcoin, Steam can, can have that immediately converted into U.S. dollars. They don't have to hold on to Bitcoin and worry about volatility. They can, they can have it converted at the time of transaction. They could also... They could even, you know, experiment and hold a few Bitcoins. They, they could convert like 80% to, to cash and then keep some as Bitcoin and see if they can maybe let it go up a little bit and then sell that. Like, you could see there's a little room for profit making there, too. It's, it's really fascinating. Uh, and it, it, it's actually quite feasible because it, it, uh, companies like Coinbase and, and BitPay and, and others just, you know, it, it's an API. It's there like integrating go. another payment system. There is though one question that um, I think it comes up once business started adopting the, adopting this in a more regular basis, like Microsoft style, is uh, because even though there is a, a a clear register of the exchanges made, um, the transactions, there is the problem with taxation. And I guess mm -hmm. in one hand, this is the thing that actually appeals to companies is because well, you know, tax evasion is a real issue, especially in multi corporations. Um, but, you know, governments might not like this. It might actually well, be a reason for them to jump on the subject. It actually could be a, It actually could be the best case because if you take the Bitcoin that you've earned, which is a profit, it, it's not, as far as taxes are concerned, a profit until you convert it to your local currency and put it in your bank account. Until then, it's just virtual money and you don't get taxed on it. And if you, you, if you take that virtual money and you buy a virtual good, I don't think there's a tax there. So if I, for example, buy internet points with my internet Bitcoin, I don't think there's any tax issue there. 
Oh, but then you, you get automatically government attention because they're saying, well, money's not flowing through the tax system. Right, <laughs> yeah. Taxes, <laughs> it might get their attention. Yeah, I can see exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, so there you go. We have links to all of that in the show notes. Last but not least, as we hit the holiday drive period, we could really use your help over at the subreddit, techtalktoday.reddit.com. Submit stories, feedback, end of show videos, old retro tech, especially ones that are holiday oriented, would be super appreciated techtalktoday.reddit.com. Also, we have feedback threads if you have a comment on a particular episode. And then also the Patreon page, patreon.com slash today. Help invest in the entire Jupiter Broadcasting Network. That way we can do things like keep it weird and limit the amount of sponsorships and be picky about who is our sponsor and also be responsible to our audience. 422 of you have backed the Jupiter Broadcasting Network over at patreon.com slash today. Thank you so much. And... If you've been a patron for a while and you haven't checked out the activity feed, go over there. We've got some new videos up and more stuff coming just for our patrons. We also have a feed over there that's open to anyone. You don't have to be a patron asking uh, where you can ask your behind-the-scenes questions, which we will answer in future videos. Uh, Patreon.com slash today. Not only is, uh, is it a nice way to say thanks for Tech Talk today, but really it's a way to invest in the whole network. So uh, television has changed quite a bit over the years. And one of the things that stands out to me, and it's maybe what stands out to me the most starkly, and maybe it's because I do ads myself, but the way sponsors have changed over the years in television. And I think it's one of the reasons I like these retro commercials is because it's a, it's, it's, to me, the way these are done, it's, it's, a, it's not just a format change, it's almost like a culture change. And it's fascinating to look back like in this time machine and, uh, and check these things out. So, it is the holiday season. People are often buying TVs for the holidays. It's, it was a big deal, and the TV space was very competitive. And also, the TV space back, oh, in, let's say, the 50s, maybe 1954, when this commercial ran, the TV space was extremely competitive around how beautiful of a piece of furniture it was. In fact, uh, I'm going to play an RCA commercial for you, but there's a Motorola commercial where Motorola goes on and on and on about how the furniture aspect of their televisions have been picked by some of the most well-respected furniture designers in the industry. And they talk about the mahogany wood and all of the different aspects of this piece of furniture. And it's so funny now to look at television and think, boy, we want them as thin and minimal as possible and up on the wall uh, now. But back then it was, make it a centerpiece of your home. Uh, this is from that era. They don't quite go into it, but you get a waff of it during this commercial. All right, thank you for being here, everybody. See you tomorrow, Friday edition of Tech Talk Today, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. See you tomorrow. If you're still watching television on a small screen set, you're missing a lot. Here, for example, is a close-up on a 10-inch set. See how much smaller it is than my head? Now I'd like to show you the same close-up on a 21-inch set. There. Just look at the difference. She's as big as I am now. You can have big screen close-ups just like that. Close-ups as large as life with RCA Victor's great new 21-inch model, the Master 21. At the lowest 21-inch price in RCA Victor history. As little as $199.95. Visit your RCA Victor dealer soon. See television's greatest value, the Master 21. Big screen 21-inch quality TV for $199.95. And remember, every year more people buy RCA Victor than any other television.